if you have an idea, like you should do it. Like people, a lot of times will ask me that kind of stuff. Why do you do this? Or where'd you get the idea for this or whatever? And, and it really kind of depends on like how honest I want to be in the moment um, or like how, how, how deep I want to go with this particular individual. But like in moments of just kind of brutal honesty, when people ask me, why do you do this stuff? I'll go, because I'm going to die someday. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the Slow Smoke Business Show. I'm your host, Jared Morgan. Got the blue gloves on, meaning we're getting ready to get into some meat over here, but we're going to get into a bunch of meat with my uh, friend and uh, a person that I couldn't wait to meet through this show, Kyle Sheely. Welcome to the show, Kyle. Happy to be here. Kyle, today we're going to be talking about regret, which is a subject that you are uh, probably... Probably never thought you'd get really good at, at something like that. And I'm actually going to do something I'm not going to regret, which is put a pork tenderloin on the grill that is stuffed with brisket and cream cheese. How about that? A little bacon wrap, too. It really depends on how much you eat of it uh, in terms of whether you're going to regret it or not. Um, yeah. And also your level of lactose intolerance, I guess, would probably play into that. <laughs> That's right. So this is two different types of meat, too, because it's got brisket in there. So we've got beef. It's like a it's like a modern-day turducken, right? It's got beef inside of pork. Yeah. Wrapped in pork. Yeah, and cream cheese inside of that. I don't know if you've, not to immediately get off uh, subject, but I, have you seen, there's a there's a guy on TikTok who duets videos, and they're just cooking videos, and, he, and it, it's, uh, the whole bit is, I will duet this video until the block of cream cheese comes in, <laughs> because they're all like casserole videos. And it's anytime there's like a pressure cooker or a crock pot and someone's doing a video, it's always like within three seconds of the beginning of the video, they throw an entire tub, <laughs> you know, block of cream cheese in. And he's like, well, that's the end. So it's a great bit. I've watched a ton of them. I need to watch that. I thought you were going to talk about Chef Reactions, which I love that guy. If you've seen him, he's like, yeah, uh, just just shitting on everybody that's cooking. <laughs> right. Except for this one dude who's like a European artist that makes all these wild things. And I'm like, you're setting the bar pretty high there, buddy. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about regret. Yeah. So you wrote uh, this book that uh, I actually started the year off reading this book, How to Host a Viking Funeral, uh, available wherever you get your books. And what was so cool, first of all, great tagline, great imagery. I was in, a, I was in an independent bookstore. I pull this book off the shelf. It immediately grabs me. Buy it. Um, I know I was trying to sound like a pretentious a-hole, right? I was in an independent <laughs> bookstore. But... I, I, I dove into this book and it was so cool because um, it was a unique way of looking at something that every human being deals with in their life, which is regret. And uh, we'll go into the story and everything in a moment about how you sort of got into this. But the, I think the most interesting part of this book was you came up with something, it was, I think it was called the Unified Theory of Regret, right? Yeah. And you got a chance to study... A lot, how many was it? How many different people sent in regrets for you for this for this project? Twenty one thousand people. Yeah, I, my goal was to get ten thousand, and we got twenty one thousand. And the unified theory of regret gave you an opportunity to get this this giant unintentional case study on what people regret later in their life. And so, what did you find out? Is the is the what is the unifying theory of regret? Basically, every single regret fell into one of like five categories. Um, and I go into those categories in the book. They're beliefs, relationships, identities, experiences, and fears. And as, assuming that I could understand what a submission said, because some of them were um, vague or, you know, the handwriting was bad or whatever. But assuming that I could read the regret and understand what it meant, like over and over again, despite there being 21,000 different submissions, they all kind of fell into one of these five different categories. And um, even though your regret might be very, very different than mine, just by identifying like sort of which category it falls into, it helps you figure out here's how here's how to work through that. Here's how to process this and how to think about this. Um, and sometimes just the knowing that, hey, it's a part of this category and there are other, there are plenty of other regrets in this category. Just that simple bit of knowledge helps you to go, oh, okay, it's it's like this. I, I've ap approached other things like this before. Um, I'm not alone in doing this. So uh, yeah, that so that's kind of how the book is broken down into these different sections. And actually I start with the last one and uh, with fears and I kind of work backwards towards beliefs. Um, but but yeah, that's sort of where the, the unified theory of regret comes in. 
So when you say you've got a whole category of fear, dive into what that meant to you exactly. Like that, so because fear, I thought was 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 to me the most interesting one. Are you saying that people are they regret that they were afraid of something, or and that kept them from from you know trying something that they you know later in life wish they'd have tried, or what what exactly do you mean by fear? Yeah, bingo. So the prompt that I asked for was not necessarily what's something you regret. It was what's something that you want to leave behind. What's something that you want to let go of from your past, which is sort of tied in with regret. That's that's oh, like yeah, a name that right. we put on that. And so one of the like most common things that people said, I want to let go of this or I want to leave this behind or I wish I didn't have this was a fear. And so it could be something like fear of, you know, spiders or fear of clowns. Like those were like specific ones that came through, but there were also like fear of being myself, fear of my own um, beliefs or fear of like what other people think about me or th these different things. And, and over and over again, people just said, I've let my life be dominated by these things I'm afraid of and I don't want to do that anymore. You have a, a way of telling this story that's that's really engaging and so it's called uh, how to host a viking funeral and those that don't know what a viking funeral is right it's like it's the coolest way to go out ever right outside of uh what was it the the crazy author from fear and the loathing that like, he had himself shot into a firework or yeah. something like that i mean that's <laughs> that's probably a little bit better than a viking funeral yeah hunter but s thompson viking funeral put yes hunter s thompson you put your body on a boat, you shove it out into a body of water, you f f shoot flaming arrows at it, and it just burns to the ground, and the credits roll, and the movie's over, right? <laughs> and this, you built a Viking ship out of paper Yeah. that was how big? Well, the, the one that's in the book was 16 feet tall and 30 feet long. It was Ooh. built out of cardboard and hot glue. Um, and, and where the whole thing kind of started, and this is the first chapter of the book kind of talks about this, is it all sort of started as a joke where I turned 30 and I was going to have a birthday party and I wanted to have some kind of a bonfire. And so I thought, oh, instead of just doing a regular bonfire, what if I did um, what if I did a Viking funeral for my 20s? And so this was years before the Viking ship that's in the book. And I built a, the first ship I built was eight feet tall and 16 feet long. It was about the size of like a minivan, give or take. And and then I built these big letters and numbers that said my 20s. And then I shot Roman candles at it and set it on fire. And I kind of thought that was just going to be another dumb thing that I had done with my friends. But some of my friends were videographers. They made a, a short little kind of mini documentary about this project. And that film started getting spread around the internet. And all of a sudden I started getting emails from people saying, hey, I saw your weird birthday you know, video. Um, and it was pretty cool. And, and then they would all kind of say the same thing because in the video, the guys asked me, hey, are you going to be sad to burn this big Viking ship because you worked so hard on it? It was like very ornate and it had all these like thousands of hand cut dragon scales. And and it was a, it was the coolest thing I'd ever built up to that point. And I said, no, I'm not sad to burn it because like that's what it was designed for. And, and you have to let go of things to make room for new things in the future. And that one clip, like I, I, they interviewed me for probably half an hour and that was like maybe the 30 seconds of interesting stuff that I said, but they put that in the video and that seemed to resonate with people. And I started getting all these emails from people that would say, loved your birthday party. And you inspired me to think about the kind of stuff that I want to let go of to make room for better stuff in my life. And then they would all kind of end their emails in the same way where they would say, just wish I could have done it with a Viking funeral. Mm. And so I got one of these emails and it was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I got another one of these emails a few weeks later. I was like, oh, that's interesting. They said the same thing as the first person. But like a year later, I'm still getting emails like on a pretty regular basis from people who are discovering this video, discovering the project, being inspired to let go of something from their past and then all saying, just wish I could do it with a Viking funeral. So I was like, you know what? If that's what people need, let's give them another Viking funeral. So I announced that I would do one more Viking funeral and it wouldn't be about me. It wouldn't be about my 20s or it would be about what's something you want to let go of from your past. So just write that down, send it to me. I'll put it in a Viking ship and I'll set it on fire. Um, and so this book is just the story of that entire project. It's quite a story too. I mean, it, you, you, you say that and it sounds like, oh, it's just going to be this like linear path where you build this thing and it's awesome and you set it on fire and, you know, that's the end of the book, right? And now you had all sorts of setbacks. <laughs> you had to find buildings that were big enough to host, to, to, to house something like that. You had glue issues. You had all these crazy things that happened. And, but what ended up happening was you built this really beautiful um, thing that, that encapsulated something that got so emotional for so many people and you had people show up and you set the thing on fire and it was this giant fire hazard 
And <laughs> I think um, I think it's just it was wild to watch people react to that and uh, and get so emotional about it. And why do you think people gravitated towards that so much? That was pretty unexpected for me as well. Like um, I like I said, I did it because people sort of had, had said, hey, this is I just wish I could have a Viking funeral. And but what I didn't expect was that like the the act of writing this thing down, or the act of sending it to me, or even the act of waiting and watching their thing be burned would be cathartic for people. I kind of expected the whole thing to just be like, oh, this is a symbolic thing where I'm letting go of this thing. But I had so many people that said, man, just writing that regret down or writing this experience down and then mailing it to you, they like felt a release from that. They were like, just doing that helped me process this thing. And then I had other people that when I burned the ship, um, you know, for all, liability reasons and all sorts of other things, it was kind of like a small group of my friends that were there on site. But we streamed the thing online and like thousands of people tuned in from all over the world. And it was fascinating. I couldn't watch it while it was happening because I was burning the Viking ship. But I went back, I recorded it and I went back and watched it the next day. And there was this whole like community of people that found each other in the comment section of this video. And they would all say, oh, how did you learn about the project? Oh, I saw Kyle speak at this thing or or I saw it was linked on this website or I heard about it on this podcast. And and then they all started talking about like, oh, here's what I let go of and 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 uh you know here's here's to moving on and and it was it was just this really really cool thing where people like when the ship started to burn people were saying like i'm crying right now like i like i've been waiting so long to watch this thing like i mailed this thing in a year ago and now it's finally being burned and um and then there was this really beautiful thing that happened where um uh, like somebody in the comments uh, as it, the ship was burning, they wrote like to moving on and then someone else wrote to moving on. And then it just kind of became this chorus of all these people like typing the same thing in the comments over and over again. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can't explain it. I don't know what happened there, but I know that like that it was emotionally impactful for people. And it was for me as well. Like I don't think of myself as a particularly like sentimental or emotional person, but um and when I talk about this in the book, that when when I finally burned the ship after all of these setbacks that you're talking about, I got kicked out of two different warehouses and and had all these ups and downs and and it felt like you know two steps forward and then one and three quarter steps back the whole way. And so when I finally like got this thing out into the field and I finally set it up and I burned it, like it felt like two and a half years of emotion just all came to the surface at once. And it was happiness and sadness and fulfillment and excitement and, and you know, like relief. And, and, all, and I just started bawling and I'm just standing there and I was kind of like, it, there was a crowd of people and I was maybe five or 10 steps in front of them um, facing the ship. And so I just start sobbing and, and then just one after another, some of my friends just kind of came up and started giving me hugs and my dad came up and it was just this really um, beautiful, like emotional experience that I completely did not expect to happen. For me, what I thought was really engaging about this book was um, just how genuine you were in approaching this. And it was, it wasn't, there was, and you, I think you talked about it in the book a little bit where you were like, there were some, some sponsors like approached you and it, it like you were very careful and you approached this with such reverence that I think that resonated with people. It certainly resonated with me when reading the book because it was, it became such an emotional human thing. Um, I don't know. That was, that was my perspective as to you, you, you were doing this for such altruistic kind of purposes. Um, that's a $5 word um, that, <laughs> I, this, that's what that's what sort of drew me in. Let me uh, let me ch let's check the pork here before I burn. If we're not just burning Viking ships, I'm I'm burning pork. Okay, <laughs> looks, looks pretty good. You ever grill out, by the way? You ever do any outs outdoor cooking? I'm not nearly as good at it as I would like to be, and uh, I have a few friends who are super good at it. So even when we come to my house and grill, usually one of them will do all the grilling because they're better at it than I am. <laughs> So, I mean, you've done all sorts of crazy stuff. I, you, you know, the Kyle Sheely meal, uh, you've done like all these crazy things. Is the Viking ship the thing that people always want to talk about still? Uh, is that, is that the most, when you, Hey, this is Kyle Sheely and they go, oh, it's the Viking ship guys. Is that, is that how it goes down? Or are you crazy internet personality now? It really depends. Yeah. I think it like, uh, with, especially because, because of the scale of some of the, the TikTok stuff that happened after this, um, you know, I got 21,000 submissions for the ship and this was before I had really built any kind of a following online. And then 
when TikTok started happening, like I have 3 million followers on that app now. And so mostly people know me for things that I've done on there or things that I've talked about on there. But it kind of, it's really all over the place because like, like you said, I've done a whole bunch of different things over the years. And usually like one or two of those projects will resonate with a particular individual. And so, um, you know, if somebody's read the book, like, the silly stuff I do on TikTok, they're like, oh, that's great. But like, like I really was impacted emotionally by this book. Or if somebody, like I have a children's book that I wrote. And if their kid really likes that book, then that's probably what they think of me for. Or right. if they discovered me on TikTok because of, you know, my dad's head tilt video or whatever, like then that's what they remember me for. So I don't know. I found it's kind of all over the place. And it really just depends on like when you were exposed to a particular thing that I did. Yeah. If you haven't seen the head tilt video, that's a classic. That was very... It was very, it was very well done. You, I don't know where you come up with a lot of this stuff, but it's, it's, uh, it's fun to watch somebody. And I think that's kind of uniquely, no one can rip you off. Cause how the hell are they going to rip you off? Like the absolute <laughs> random things that you're doing on, on the internet. Um, if, if you now have become like this unintentional expert of regret, right. Uh, and things you want to let go. What is there something that Kyle has done? speaking in the third person, that you regret? Oh, there's all sorts of stuff that I regret. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's different things that, that have happened. To, like, you mentioned the Kyle Sheely meal. That, uh, I, I don't know what your understanding of that meal was, but that was like a, a thing that kind of blew up and then kind of blew up in my face. And and there were people that were mad about it because it was a, it was a, basically an influencer campaign that was planned with this gas station and went viral beyond my wildest dreams. Like, we kind of thought... Like at the time, my videos, if they were doing really well, they would get like a million views. And and so I thought, oh, if this campaign goes out there, like the most people that are going to see it is going to be like a fraction of my own audience. And then the first video did 35 million views yeah. and it turned into this massive thing that was way bigger than we expected it to be. And then it was kind of like, oh, th like I, I saw somebody once that said um, going viral is not what you think it is because it always means a bunch of people who have never seen your stuff before are now seeing your stuff. And so they have no context for who you are or do they like you or not? They just see this one video. And so that like went really viral and then people found out, oh, this was planned out with this gas station and and like, and they got mad about it and some people didn't care. And like, so like looking back, I'm like, oh, I would totally do that completely different um, <laughs> if I had to do that now. Uh, but, but at the same time, like, I think that sort of the message of the book is like, you can't change the past. Like I talk about that in there. Like there's, the, we're not building a time machine here. We can't go back in time to undo any of this stuff. What's important isn't like the, that you would try to like just, oh, I should have done this differently and just dwell on that. It's really to learn um, how do I do better in the future? And what did I learn from this thing? And I, and I talk about the reason we think about Regret is it's the same reason that that coaches and athletes watch game tape because you know like hey in the future I can't I can't reshoot that that basket you know like at the buzzer or whatever and I can't win state when I lost it or whatever like but what I can do is know that hey when I get into similar situations in the in the future how do I how do I react a little bit quicker a little bit better or a little bit um, you know more optimally and so when I look back on the stuff from my life I'm not sitting there and, and just going oh that sucks I, I can't believe I did that instead of going man what was the mistake that I made there um, and or what was the mistake that was made by someone else or, or whatever and how can I learn from that and move on in the future and so there's business stuff that's like that for me. There's personal stuff that's like that for me. Um, but the goal isn't to sit and dwell in that. It's to figure out, okay, how do we how do we learn from this and, and get better? Um, that was actually a big concern of mine when I was writing this book because I was like, I don't want to be the regret guy. I don't want, because that's a, such a heavy, like heavy thing. And, and as you know, you're, all these other projects that you're talking about of mine, like I'm not a heavy, heavy guy. Like I, I, I love that side of stuff, but I also, I love laughter and joy and, and, and making people laugh about some dumb idea. And so for me, it wasn't about, hey, let's sit and dwell on the past. It's it's about, hey, how can we have the best possible future? I think this, the other things that you do being so lighthearted, I don't know, there's, there's a weird um, way that sort of draws people in and wants to hear your take on a serious subject like that, um, more so because you're not normally serious. I think it would be less, to me at least, it would be less interesting if a very somber PhD, you know, was like, today, you know, today we're going to study regret. And we it, it just, ugh, you know, and, and I just think when you approach a, a heavy subject like that, this is one of the takeaways I have from your book. When you approach a heavy subject like that, 
and you surround it with, um, I don't want to call it irreverence, but it was, it was just lighthearted, intentional, um, you know, not being, not taking yourself too seriously. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it made it easier to approach a heavy subject and it didn't feel like the entire book was a, was a just pummeling your emotions all the time. It was just, yeah. um, it, it made it very human and very approachable. Thank you. I, 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 that's something, my career, my background uh, professionally is that I'm a, I'm a keynote speaker. And so for the last 13 years, I've gone around and, and spoken. I started speaking in like high schools and colleges. And today I speak a lot in, in corporations and conventions. And, um, and like the one trick that I have that I just go back to over and over again is I'm going to make you laugh and then I'm going to make you cry. Like by the end of it, like I, I use laughter as a door into things because what I found is that specifically because I started speaking to young people, like speaking to high school students. And anytime a grown up gets in front of a group of high school students, they just immediately put walls up where they're like, either this guy's going to ask me to do something I don't want to do, or he's going to ask me to stop doing something I really like doing. And, and so they just kind of throw these walls up. And what I've realized is like, if you, if you don't get them to let those walls down, you're just going to be, you both of you are going to be banging your head against the wall the whole time. And it's nothing is going to get accomplished. But if you can get them to kind of set that wall down for a second and actually just connect person to person, person, then, then you can get stuff done. And for me, the easiest way to get them to let their walls down is if you can get someone to laugh, they will kind of like, they'll disarm themselves for a second and they'll go, Oh, okay, this guy, he's all right. And so like, that's, I, I've done that anytime I'm ever trying to get something across. I go, if I can get you to laugh first, then I know that that creates this bit of connection and you'll, and a little bit of trust. You're like, okay, I like this guy. I'll hear what he has to say. And so I think that like, I, I just applied that trick a bunch of different times over and over again. And in the book that's, yeah, it's, it, it is about regret, but also there's just the ridiculousness of like, Hey, we're going to have a Viking funeral for 21,000 regrets. It's not, Oh, we're just going to, you know, read these and process them or, or something like that. Or we're going to do an academic study on regret. There, there was another book that came out at the time that was like very similar and, I made a joke about it. I was like, oh, how many, this guy, he had like New York Times bestselling author, incredible guy. Um, and he had done a survey about regrets and then just wrote a book about like what he learned from it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I built a Viking ship and set them all on fire. So like, <laughs> it's very similar work, but, but I wanted there to be that like a little bit of like ridiculousness because it, like you said, it just sort of takes people out of what they're expecting. We talked about in the unifying theory of regret. I want to, I want to dive back into that for a second. Um, there were the different categories. There were, there was fear Yep. and I'm bad at memorizing things. So give me the words again. If it was fear, beliefs, relationships, identities, experiences, and fears. So I can just real quickly go through like, and we address them backwards in the book. And so fears we already talked about, and then there's experiences, which is like, this is either a thing that happened to me or a thing that I wish would have happened to me that didn't. Um, and, and like, there's a lot of people that kind of hang on to something like that. They're like, if I only would have done this, or I did this thing and now I regret doing that. And so that's like, again, you can't go back in the past. You can't undo that thing, but you can try to learn from why did I do that? What were my motivations and, and what led to that situation? And why, you know, how would I do it differently? Or if it's a kind of an anti-experience of someone saying, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have asked the girl out. I wish I would have applied for that job. I wish I would have gone out for the team. Then, then the kind of the takeaway is like, well, what's the thing right now that you're going to wish you had done later? Um, so that's experiences. Identities was uh, about stuff that you believe about yourself, like something that you say, this is who I am. I want to stop thinking of myself as this thing. Um, and so mine in that in the book that I talk about was my struggle with the term artist. Um, I've always had other people say, Kyle, you're such a creative person. You're such an artist. And I like never accepted that for myself because I always thought artist was this other thing that I wasn't qualified for. And, and like, finally what kind of unlocked it for me was I was talking to my friend Andy who is a professional artist he's an illustrator he's done work for like the New York Times and the New Yorker and YouTube and like all these amazing brands and he and I were talking and, and he was like you're an artist and I was like no I'm not and he said why aren't you an artist and I said and like the only thing I could come up with is that I can't draw realistic faces and he just started <laughs> laughing at me and he was like First of all, that's stupid. And second of all, like I can't draw realistic faces. And I started laughing because I was like, you're right. Like Andy, he's an amazing artist, but his his style is very cartoony and exaggerated. And it's like illustration style. Like it's not photorealistic faces. And, and so that kind of like snapped me out of it. But there were other people that said, I've always thought of myself as a bad mom or a bad daughter, or I, I'm inadequate in this area. And, and I want to let go of that because 
carrying that sort of in some ways becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or limits you in some ways, but also it's just a really heavy burden to carry. Um, so that's identities. And then there was relationships, which is, is pretty obvious. People saying, I wish I would have gotten out of this relationship sooner, or I wish I would have treated this relationship differently. And that could be romantic relationships. That could be marriage relationships. That could be friendships. Um, it could be anything. Just like the way that we treat people, other people are a big part of our life. And, and so how those things... Uh, often it's really like how they end um, or how they could have gone better that we look back on and and have regrets about. That one's a little tricky and I talk about this in the book because a relationship like by definition inherently involves another person. And so whether or not relationships can be fixed usually comes down to like, do both of you want to make the effort at the same time? Um, And sometimes the answer is no and that can be really tricky, but how do you move on from that? And then the last one is beliefs. And um, the reason that I, you know, I, I, it spells out brief if you do it, B-R-I-E-F, <laughs> beliefs, relationships, identities, experiences, and fears. But I did it backwards in the book because really what it comes down to is all of these are actually beliefs. Um, and, and beliefs are actually the only one that you can do anything about. Like a, a fear is just your belief about this other thing and that it's going to be bad for you, that it's going to hurt you. Um, an experience is its own thing, but really it's your belief about what that experience means. Like, oh, because this thing happened or didn't happen, I have this belief that now I can or can't do X, Y, and Z. And identity is just a belief about yourself. Um, Relationships, like, again, something you can't change because it involves other people. But what are your beliefs about that? And a lot of people carry these beliefs like, oh, because my mom was an alcoholic, I'm going to be an alcoholic. Or because I didn't have this thing in my life, now I am forever limited from ever having this other thing or the same thing. And so really what it comes down to at the end of the day is what do you believe about your past and what it means for you. And is it possible that some of those beliefs are not grounded in reality or that you could change those or swap that out for a better or more empowering or more fulfilling or more true belief? Um, and so, yeah, that's that's sort of to give away the whole the whole end of the book. Like that's that's how, how the whole thing sort of comes together. Hey, I'm recording. Can y'all, bye-bye. Or y'all can go walking. I got this. Is the here's the here's the funny thing about backyard podcasts. Sometimes people just walk in your backyard, and so that's my my daughter, and my mom. Hey, <laughs> sorry. If I smelled a uh, cream cheese brisket pork wrap, I would probably walk into your backyard too. So I was gonna say they'll probably edit that out. Actually, they'll probably leave it in, given the way the show goes sometimes. So uh, <laughs> let's check on said pork loin. Uh, very nice. I like that. Um, Want to hit it with just a little more. They call this the Texas sugar. Texas, that's what they call me in college. No, that's not true. <laughs> Maybe let's, let's flip it on its head. What would Kyle say he's most proud of? I've struggled a lot in my life to be proud of anything that I've done. I don't know why. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, I think it's like a Midwest thing, uh, like Midwest kind of raised in the church. Uh, like I mean, anything that you're good at is probably bad. Um, and may, or that was also just me. Like all the things I was good at growing up were like were seen as negative. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was good at being funny and getting attention and and sort of you know being obnoxious. And so I literally had a, te- a, a teacher tell me at one point, like Kyle, listen, all this is great, but being the center of attention is not a career path that you can have. <laughs> and it's funny because now I look back and I'm like, ah, kind of is. Kind of like, is. Kind of what yep. worked out for me. Um, um, but for me, I think the thing that I'm proudest of is just that like I, when I have an idea or a dream, I chase after it. Um, and and that's, I, I'm proud of that because that's what I want for my kids. Like that's what I want for for really for everyone. And so that's, most of what I do, like when I'm on stage and speaking at conferences is, is always, it's just about trying to get people to chase their own crazy ideas. And, and cause I, I believe that like, that's, that's where the good stuff is, is like the stuff that, that keeps you up at night. The idea that you can't explain to someone else, but you just know you're onto something like that's the stuff that I love. And I don't even really care if it's, if it works or if it's successful or not. I just think that like, there's something about saying, Hey, I can't let go of this idea and so I'm going to try it. And so whenever I have ideas like that, I go after them. And every good thing in my life has come out of me chasing a crazy idea. Wow. Um, and so I think that's probably what I'm proudest of is just like going after those things and pushing through all of all of the difficult stuff that you mentioned with, you know, the, this ship had three main pieces to it and they were each, you know, 16 feet tall or 16 feet long or whatever. And, and two out of three of them completely fell apart and had to be rebuilt at some point in the process. And and there were all these points where I wanted to quit and and nobody would have faulted me for quitting, yeah. but I I just kind of kept pushing through. Um, 
And some of that was just stubbornness and pride and all sorts of other stuff. But when I look back, I'm like, oh man, I'm glad I didn't give up on that. So, um, so yeah, I think that's for me is like the thing that I'm proud of. I think there's a lot of life stories that, that sound like that, right? It's, it's how, there's a lot of pride on the other side of deciding to continue on something that's difficult, right? And, and I mean, I, as I was reading the book, I remember thinking, you know, you, cause you kind of go into how you, again, there would be moments to quit there that you would have gone, well, okay, I get it. But you had all these people that had poured all their heart into, uh, you know, writing out their feelings and, and you sort of, you, you sort of persevered. And I think that was, you know, a lot of good of life comes from deciding that you're going to push through the friction and all the good things in life, at least for me, none of them have come easy. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you, that's, that's why those things are the good things in life. Most people don't have them because they don't push through the friction that you run into. I, I'll say too, um, I'll kind of let me throw some love your way too on this book. What was cool about this book for me as I was reading it to start the year, I do a very intentional process and I've talked about this on the show a couple of times where I go <clears throat> and I like sequester myself from my daily life. And I have this whole process I call the living ledger where I write out like the person that I want to be in my, my personal life, my professional life and my spiritual life. And uh, I kind of have this thing and I keep it every year and I read back through it and it's very enlightening and it's, it's really helped me be the person that I am. And when I, I did that this year, I actually drove to, out of town and spent a night by myself. And that's where I went in this bookstore and I found this book. Um, what was cool about reading this was um, it's, it's super inspiring to watch you do your thing in this book. And then of course, as I've, I've watched you, you know, do your other things, it's inspiring to see you go some, go for something simply for the sake of going for it. And for me, it was, my whole life has been so mission driven. I, you know, I built a company for 15 years and I was doing that because I wanted to flip my family tree and I wanted to, you know, change the, 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 the industry that I was working in, how these like missions and things, and it was inspiring to watch you do something simply for the sake of doing it. And that really inspired me to keep this show going through some early kind of rough patches I had at the beginning of the year where I was starting to go, do I really need to, you know, devote the time to this? I've got two different businesses that I'm trying to get off the ground. I've got all these other things. I'm a dad. I'm a, you know, I'm working in a charity as well. I've got all these other things. But I think you're, you're right to say that, you know, your everything that you everything that you're proud of all the good things that came out of your life came from you chasing a crazy idea and um it's you don't find a lot of people that champion that anymore in a tangible way and so i just wanted to thank you for inspiring me to keep this show going through this book well thanks man i mean i i think that it's funny like when i was a kid i was i was always this like super curious kid i always wanted to know why did this happen or why did this person do this or why is the world this way and and i remember like my dad always wanted to answer those questions for me and and so like he would start out by kind of explaining well this is why that happened and then i would go okay but why like i would always want to go like three whys deeper and then there was always this moment where my dad would kind of just give up and he would go I don't know, Kyle, I, I guess it just seemed like the thing to do at the time. Like that was this line that he would always say. And I've thought about that a lot. By the way, sorry if you hear, there's someone hammering in this building and I have no <laughs> idea why they're doing that. But um, uh, but but I, I've thought about that a lot like in terms of um, art. And like a lot of times you'll go to an art gallery and there'll be like an, a really amazing piece of art. And then there'll be like an artist statement that's next to it where the artist says, here's why I made this thing. And I just stopped reading those because they like, they're so like, so pretentious and full of themselves so many times where <laughs> the artist is like, Oh, this piece is an exploration into my inner turmoil during what blah, 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 blah. And you look at the piece, you're like, no, this is just a painting of a pop can or something. I was fine with it just being a painting of a pop can, but when you brought in all this other stuff, and, and that's fine if that is like legitimate, but I feel like a lot of times we manufacture like, oh, the reason I did this was because of this deeper thing. And I, I kind of have become a fan of just like, if someone says, why'd you do this thing? I go, oh, I don't know. It just seemed like the thing to do at the time. Like it was what I wanted to do in the moment. It seemed like a good idea. It was the best of the ideas that were present in that moment. Um, and I think that's just like, it's a good, it's a good kind of general life philosophy. If you don't have this, like if the skies don't open up and, and a voice from heaven tells you, go do this thing. Well, then moment to moment, all of us are just doing whatever the best thing is in front of us in that moment. Um, and and so for me, like these these projects and these ideas and things, like it really has just been like, hey, I had this idea and and sometimes an idea just won't leave you alone. And so you're like, I'm gonna try it. Um, 
And I think that your story of like you being inspired by this podcast is such a perfect example of like, you don't know where your ideas are going to go. I, I never would have anticipated when I started this whole journey, which was like the whole thing was just a dumb birthday party idea. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have a Viking funeral for my 20s. I would have never imagined that like I'm now seven years past that, like that seven years later, some guy that I've never met, like emails me and then we end up on a podcast and you're saying, hey, because of you started on this journey and then seven years later, now I didn't give up on this thing because of that. And and like man, like I I'm honored and I'm so like uh, grateful that you shared that story and also part of me feels like I had almost nothing to do with that. Like <laughs> I I just sort of put this thing out into the world and it did what it's going to do. And I think that like the same thing is going to be true. Like there will be people who hear your podcast that like you weren't trying to inspire that specific person and sometimes people will take away a message that you're like you got that out of what I was saying, but like, yeah. but, but it's, in, it's so, it's incredible. Just like the power that we all have to, to impact other people with the work that we put out there. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think that like, I think any of us, if you have an idea, like you should do it. Like people, a lot of times will ask me that kind of stuff. Why do you do this? Or where'd you get the idea for this or whatever? And, and it really kind of depends on like how honest I want to be in the moment. Um, or like how, how, how deep I want to go with this particular individual. But like in moments of just kind of brutal honesty, when people ask me, why do you do this stuff? I'll go, because I'm going to die someday. Like <laughs> right. someday yeah. I'm going to die. And that seems like, like that that is a thing I think about all the time. It's just, hey, once you're dead, as far as I know, like you're not making stuff anymore. You don't see like a lot of people that are doing their best work from the grave. And so like this is your one chance to make an impact. This is your one chance to put crazy stuff out into the world. Does the world need a Viking ship? I don't know. I, it, I don't really think about that. I just think about, well, I'm going to be dead someday and I this is my chance to do it now. Um, And so that's like for you, like, you could always go, does the world need another podcast? Does the world need a specifically another white guy talking to another white guy podcast? Like, <laughs> no, probably not. But there is an individual out there who probably needs something from your specific podcast that they're not going to get from somebody else. And so that's a good enough reason for me. Yeah, I t totally agree. And I think, you know, you don't always know where the destination is going to be when you try to do something great. But um that doesn't mean, I, I think that's what freezes a lot of people. That doesn't mean you don't go for it, right? It doesn't mean that you're supposed to have all the answers or it's supposed to be this neat and tidy little, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to land here and whatever. If, if, it, if it's easy like that or if it's something that you can really put in a neat little tidy package like that, it's probably not worth doing. Or, or there's probably been a lot of other people that have done it. Yeah. Right? I just don't, I just don't think that's where good things in life come from. There's some quote, I can't remember who said it, but it's like, if you can see the path laid out in front of you, that's a good way to know that it's not your path ah. um, because your path is going to be like one step at a time. And then there's that Steve Jobs quote. As a motivational speaker, I'm like contractually obligated to mention Steve Jobs um, in every podcast interview. <laughs> but but he has this quote where he says like, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back. And mm. and that's in his Stanford commencement address where he talks about like, he you know went to, went to college at Reed College and then it, like, started just taking whatever classes interested him. And one of them was like a calligraphy class. And that's where he learned about type. And, and like years later that he put all of that stuff into the Mac and that's what like differentiated the Mac was like, Hey, they had all these different typefaces and all this stuff. He didn't yeah. do that on purpose. He didn't think, Oh, I bet down the road, I'm going to need to know. Like he just was, pursuing like the best thing in front of him at the time and trusting that it was going to lead to something. Um, I had this, this story I share on stage sometime of like one of, one of the projects that I did years and years ago, like was in back in 2012, I had this friend that, uh, we're still friends. He was just texting me this morning and he's a marathon runner. And, and I was like, he would always try to get me to run marathons and I would always like make fun of him for running marathons. And so I decided just kind of as a joke to mess with him. <laughs> I know where this story's going. I love it. I was like, I'm going to make a fake marathon, like where like anybody <laughs> can participate. You like, you pay me money. That's important. And then I'll send you all of the stuff that you would get from a regular marathon. I'll send you a race bib and a medal and a t-shirt. Then we'll all go outside on this one day. We'll take a picture of ourselves pretending like we're running. We'll upload it to social media and it'll look like this whole race happened. And I did this like literally just to mess with my friend. And the first time we did it, like we thought, 
maybe we could get 100 people to sign up. And we ended up having 1,000 people that signed up. We were in Runner's World <laughs> Magazine. It was sponsored by Groupon. It was this whole crazy thing. And, and I was like, oh man, what an amazing experience. And I thought that was the end of it. And then years later, like seven or eight years later, when I built this TikTok following, I was just gonna make a video telling that story. And then two different friends of mine saw the video before I posted it. I was like, hey, what do you think about this? And they both said, if you post this, people are gonna wanna do it again. Like you should, you should do the fake marathon again. And so I was like, oh, I don't know, we'll see. And I posted it on TikTok. And 8,000 people in the first 24 hours were like, let's do this. And so I was like, okay, we'll do it again. Here's a free sign up. You can print out this bid. We'll all go outside on the same day. And 34,477 people signed up, <laughs> um, which is, makes us technically bigger than the Boston Marathon. Uh, but uh, wow. but the best thing about it was we, we gave people this little, just like this little prompt of like, hey, take print out this bib, go outside and pretend to run, post a TikTok or a video or a picture or whatever of you doing that. And then we'll stitch them all together and it'll look like this highlight video from this race. And people just like went and took that little seed and they just like, pun fully intended they ran with it and so uh -huh. we ended up having people that like people set up aid stations like at a at a at a race where they'll have like a hundred cups of water and then they would like knock some of them over because that's what happens like in a race people are running by they grab one they knock two or three of them over and so like it looks this looks legit and it was just somebody just faked that for this race people set up like um like one guy who was an off-duty paramedic like got his his ambulance and put like a uh uh, found our logo, like stole it online somewhere and and wrote like uh, first aid stop number three, which I thought was like such a clever little thing where he like created this fictional universe where there were two other ambulances somewhere else in the race. <laughs> and it was just this amazing display of creativity and joy. And and but but the, the thing that really got me was like, I started getting all these messages from people after it happened where they would say, man, like, cause this was during the middle of lockdown. And so like, they were like, I can't, you can't do stuff like this right now. Like you can't go outside and be in big groups of people. But this made me feel like I was connected to all these people around the world who were doing this thing. And it like really kind of brought me out of this funk. And and then this one message I'll never forget, it's in the highlight video. There's this, um, there's this mom, and her two little kids and they're kind of just like standing in their room just like running in place or whatever and one of the kids uh is completely bald like no hair and and that that kid had leukemia and the mom emailed me and was like hey um every other day i'm a mom of a kid with leukemia but on this day i was just a mom just for like this one little moment of time like it was i was just a mom we were just like having fun and Oh my gosh! Like I like I still get chills thinking about that. Wow! And I, at the same time, I go, this whole thing started. I was just trying to mess with my buddy. Like I had no idea that years down the road it'd be like, oh, we went from we were trying to get a hundred people, and then like the thirty four thousand people, and 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 the Washington Post wrote about it, and and then this this leukemia kit, like all of this stuff. It all came out of just this like little spark of an idea of like, oh, I'm gonna mess with my buddy. And so I, I love, that's why I will always be like, whatever your idea is, you should do it. Like you should try it because I don't know where it's gonna go, but I can almost guarantee it's gonna go somewhere different and better than what you think it's gonna be. Well, I don't know if you're a spiritual guy, but I think, you know, it. God uses you in very humorous ways, right? I mean, here's, here's all these like goofy ways for you to do things and suddenly you're reaching people, uh, everyone. And what a cool legacy to be building through, through time. Um, there is a piece of your story I want to go back to. We kind of, we briefly touched on it and it was the Kyle Sheely meal. And the reason I want to go back to that was, um, I went through something that was probably one one hundredth of the size of like, so you got some backlash there. So I started a company that was an online proctoring company and we, Watched people take tests over a webcam. It, it got very, very big um, and it was very successful, helped a lot of schools and was a very, very useful tool during COVID um, because campuses no longer could function and they needed to have a way to make sure people were taking tests and not cheating and everything. Um, the feedback or the, the amount of online hate that I got personally for being the guy that started, uh, like if you Google... Uh, or if you went on Twitter and you searched the name of the company was Proctor U and the phrase mom's a hoe, right? You just would get everybody making the same joke. Whoever started Proctor U, your mom's a hoe, right? And just so like it, it was shenanigans. And what was, what was crazy to me was once, once, the, once the pandemic started, nothing had changed 
about the way we did business or the way we operated or what our mission was. We were simply trying to keep the le- legitimacy of an exam, um, we, even when it was delivered online, like that you could believe the results, right? And, and that's a big thing at scale. Nobody, everybody likes to think about cheating in the singular kind of thing where, okay, well, if I cheat on my test or if I don't, does it really matter? But if you zoom out and you look at it on the macro scale, if nobody believes that, you know, you get a degree from this university that you actively, actively know the content, then it kind of tears the whole thing down, right? And so... I believe that to my core. And that was our mission was to to sort of do it that way. We got so much irrational hate during the pandemic about we were, people would say that you're just spying on people. And there's all this sort of really strange ways of looking at what we did. And it took me um, a while, especially I got personal attacks a lot online. And it took me a while to figure out where to put those things in my head because up until that point, most of the stuff that we had ever had her had been kind of hurled at us were just silly stuff and whatever. Um, or it was, um, people were saying, Oh, isn't this such a cool story? What this company had done. I had to kind of get to a place where I understood that if people actually knew me or if they met me in person, they would not feel the way they do, but that when they're looking at this in an article or whatever, that it was this kind of this symbol and it just fit into this narrative of tech companies that are mean and untrustworthy and everything else. So I wonder when you did the Kyle Sheely meal thing, and if you haven't seen that video, go look at it. It's hilarious. I, I, I thought it was even, even after I learned that it was a, a thing that you had, the gas station had participated in, it's still hilarious and brilliant to me and just so funny to watch. And then people found out that, Oh, he was actually working with the gas station. It was sort of like, some some balloon popped or whatever and they yeah. found out Santa Claus wasn't real. <laughs> How did you learn to deal with that kind of backlash? I'll be honest, it took a long time and it was really hard. Um so when when all that stuff happened, it was weird because all of the best parts of it and all of the worst parts of it were happening at the same time. So like the video was going like like I said, I, I thought maybe if if we go great, it'll get a million views. And the first video did thirty five million views like right away. And then in like when I had the dad head tilt video go really, really viral, um, it was it was like in an earlier era of TikTok where brands weren't as uh, like they hadn't gotten their stuff together and gotten onto TikTok. So when this video went viral, like every brand that was on TikTok was commenting on it and like sending me DMs and like like and it was like there was a moment when this video was like if you were on TikTok during that time you saw this video yeah um i later learned like TikTok internally like em- employees at TikTok were sending the video to each other going like this is good content this is the kind of stuff that we need more of i had friends that i hadn't talked to in like years like kids i went to high school with um that because it all happened like kind of around thanksgiving and i had i had one friend who said i'm at thanksgiving in like north carolina i'm in missouri so like nobody nowhere anywhere near where this is happening he said there's like 27 or 30 people here um none of them know that I know you and every single one of them is talking about this video. And so it was like crazy. All this amazing stuff was happening and then it started to like implode and then it just shifted like immediately where where like I literally went to bed one night, woke up the next morning and and it was just inundated with video. Like a video had gone up where this person said, hey, this whole thing was staged and like basically F this guy. And then it just became like, um, like it was a trend to just like hate me and it was weird because like I vacillated wildly back and forth like on one hand I was like oh my gosh like I never I was never trying to like mislead anyone like I like like I when you mentioned the Santa Claus thing like I kind of generally think anytime I see something on the internet I assume that it's planned out and staged and I just don't care sure. because I just like that's how every like when 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 some big publicity thing happens and a week later it's like oh actually Chipotle was behind that or whatever I'm always like oh that's awesome like, and like good job Chipotle because I, like, I tend to think of it as like people would say they're like man f you like there's a million people pushing commercials at us all day every day and and we i thought you were like the one guy who wasn't doing that and i see it as like oh there's a million people pushing commercials at us every day oh this person actually tried to make it fun like like that's right that's what i was so i would go like on one hand i was like oh my gosh i'm so sorry i, I didn't wasn't wasn't trying to mislead anybody i was trying to make this cool thing and like, I'm, I'm so sorry and then there were some people like some of the backlash was so intense that it made me swing the other way to be like 
oh my gosh, get over it. Like, yeah. because there were, like, there was, there were people, and, and it's hard to read tone on the internet. So you also don't know, like, are these people trolling? Are they being genuine? But like people, it's one girl I'll never forget. Like she, she posted, finding out that the Kyle Sheely meal was planned uh, was the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And I just thought, what an amazing life you must have lived. Like, if this is the worst thing that's ever happened to you, like, I, like that's <laughs> a, that's incredible. Like, what privilege. And then there were like people that said, like, that, like people like Kyle Sheely are everything that is wrong with the internet. And I was like, oh my God. there is child trafficking on the internet. Like, they're, they're like, you can hire people to murder people on the internet. Like, I'm the worst thing because I lied about a brand deal or, like, didn't disclose. So I it was really hard for me to know, how do I process this? Because on one hand, I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry. And on the other hand, I'm like, okay, but don't crucify me. I didn't do that. And so I, it took a long time. I mean, I literally went to therapy about this. Like, and then and then I would like start to make progress and then like some other thing would happen. Like right as it started dying down, this big YouTuber made like a 28 minute video about me and just kind of like just dumping on the entire situation. And then his comments went crazy of people being like, F this guy. And so it was just like, it, it was really difficult. But I think w part of what helped me was what you said of like, like when I was talking to my therapist, she was like, does anybody who actually knows you care about this at all? And I was like, oh no. Like, first of all, all of my friends knew about this in advance. Like I wasn't right. trying to hide it. Like I had told them about it beforehand. Oh, here's what's gonna happen. And this is gonna play out. And they were like, oh, that's awesome. And so like none of them cared. Um, and and also it's like, they all, they know me. Like they've, I've like watched their kids and like they've come to my house. And like, if you really know me, you'd go, oh, Kyle just made a stupid mistake here that like a lot of people might've made. Um, and it doesn't change like how you might feel about the overall theme, but you would go, oh, I don't hate him specifically. And so I think like it just took a while to get past that. And also I had a conversation with um, a reporter and and she she herself had been like doxxed and canceled and had all this kind of stuff happen to her um, because she reports on politics and the other side of that political uh, spectrum does not like her. And so, and she had just seen what had happened to me and we, we had this conversation and she was like, Kyle, you've got, it's okay to block people. It's okay to like, it's okay to delete comments. It's okay to like, you don't, you being on the internet does not mean that you have to just say, okay, whatever gets thrown at me, I'm going to take it. Like I deserve this. And yeah. when she, she said that it was like, oh, okay. Like you're like, I, I have permission because I think I felt like, well, I put this out there. I've got to take whatever comes my way. But some of it was so just like mean and and like and not true and unfounded that I was just like okay like you're gone like it's fine like there there's a whole other side of TikTok if you want to go you post all that you want on your page about how you hate me on my page you're not going to do that and so uh, that's right so yeah it just took a while to to realize that and then also realizing that like like there was some like legitimate trauma for me where because I like I have enough followers that I get noticed in public and and it's it's not like a huge deal but like it happens enough where people will go hey you're the TikTok like l last week I was in Costco and uh, my son like walked to the end of this aisle to get something and he comes back he's like dad those people are talking about you and I was like oh really and he was like yeah and then they they swung him around like a minute later like you could tell they had made an excuse to c come back into the aisle they were just in and these two ladies they were like hey are you the guy on TikTok and they were super nice everyone's always super nice but when this stuff was happening and then people would come up to me and be like hey are you Kyle Sheely I was like oh no dude is somebody just gonna like like decide that this is their chance to cuss me out like in front of my kids or whatever and so there was like every time someone would come up and be like hey are you kyle Sheely?" i was like yeah and then they were like oh man i love your content and i realized no one has no one in real life has ever actually like said anything to me about this that's negative it's all people on the internet who don't have to look a human being in the face and it's all stuff that like you would never say to someone <laughs> in like face to face yeah and so i just kind of realized like oh this is just a weird thing that happens as like a, kind of a consequence of being online and i hate it but um it's it doesn't really have anything to say about who i am as a person and anybody who would pretend that it does uh is probably they probably just need to go outside you know they, pro they probably should like go like you know there's that phrase <laughs> online of like you need some sunshine in your life yeah yeah yeah, there's that phrase of like touch grass you know and like it's, it's like kind of just a, like a way to end an argument online it's like dude you're like you're too online like oh just go outside go touch some grass and yeah and so i think i think that all of that together sort of sort of helped me to just realize um and and there was also a conversation i had early on with like right as stuff started blowing up in like in my face 
another guy on TikTok who had had his own scandal like a year before. Um, and his like, again, was something I looked at. I watched all the videos about his thing and I was like, I still am not really clear about what people are mad about. Like, I don't understand how they made this jump. Yeah. And so, but he reached out. He's like, hey man, I saw this is happening. If you want to talk, I can tell you what's going to happen. And I was like, oh man. And he basically was like, it's going to suck for about a month and then it's going to get better. But like, there will be people that 10 years from now are still probably mad about this. And he kind of walked me through it. And he said that something that somebody said to him was, hey, if you... uh if you don't want this, you can just delete your account and go back to being a person who just like works a job and is not on the internet all the time. Like that's, that is an option for you. Um, but if you want to keep doing the thing that you're doing, then you can just see this as like, this is the table stakes. This is the cost of admission. This is the tax that I have to pay to be a big person on the internet. Is it some people are going to throw rocks at me? Um, and, and so like him saying that kind of helped me to go, oh yeah, I don't have to do this. Like if I want to, so I'm making a choice every day, do I show up or not? Um, and there were times when I was like, you know what? I just don't have it in me today. So I'm gonna like, I've posted way less frequently than I used to. And some of that's because I feel like this whole thing kind of helped me to have a more balanced relationship with what it means to be like a content creator. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that story because I think, I don't think people fully appreciate the human side of the other side of that about when it just, it, you know, reality can get bended to whatever people want it to be. When you start seeing people that are parroting. So they, they weren't actually directly involved with the situation. They're writing about what somebody else wrote about that somebody else wrote about. And it's like gone 10 different loops now. And oh, I heard this and I heard that. And I think that is, um, this is the worst of the internet. It's such a terrible <laughs> phrase that you were talking about. I th but I think that is the, I think that is sort of the nature of today's internet is it's so easy to kind of hide behind um, a screen name and a, and a little avatar and just, but no one would ever say that in person. Yeah. And I, somebody said this one time and I, I thought this was, people are going to wait, wait till the comments section show up when I say this, but like internet commenter is, is usually like the lowest, life form on the internet, right? Because it's so, you could literally, you have nothing invested in taking a pot shot at somebody. Yeah. And if it hits, great. If you say something wildly racist or terrible, like the downside is almost nothing, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe your account gets banned, you make a new account, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's just that. And that, and because of that, um, it just allows people to say the, the craziest stuff, the stuff that's unhinged from reality, and yeah, I like the whole, they need to go touch grass thing. I think people... I'm not a big fan uh, of this guy in general, but um, I mean, not that I'm, I don't know. I just, I don't have like, I'm not a super fan. Breaking news, Kyle Sheely doesn't like this guy. Say it, who is it? Tony Robbins. Um, like, But Tony okay. Robbins had this thing, someone else told me about this. I haven't seen the actual clip, but where he was saying that like, that what people want in life is significance. And then he said the easiest way to like hijack significance, to become the most significant person in someone's life is to hold a gun to their head. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're the most significant person in their life. And that happens on the internet all the time. Like if I'll like if I just start just harassing you, then immediately you're like, who is this person? What are they doing? How do I get them to stop? And that is, it is a cheap form of significance. And like, you can tell there are some people that just get high on that. Like, and, and there was this one guy and I kept trying to have like good faith dialogue with him. He would go, you did this, you said this. And he, of course, no profile picture, no like username that's like attachable to anything human. It's just like this random thing. But I was like in, engaging with him in good faith. And then finally, like I Googled his user name and I just found all of these other places like all of these other videos that he was commenting on and just stirring up debate and I just thought oh that's this guy's thing that's what he does for significance is just engages with like it starts conflict and and stuff on the internet and and I was like oh okay I don't I don't want to be that I don't want to first of all I don't want to give this guy his drug and second of all I don't want him to be getting his significance like in a way that is draining energy and life and love for my work from me yeah um and so yeah it's just at some point you can kind of just go oh you know what man that's not that's not my thing I'm not trying to do that and and um and yeah it's it's I don't know you're right like the internet it's just such a weird place and there aren't consequences for so much of it and people forget like at some point and I don't know what the number is, but there's a number that you hit where all of a sudden 
you stop becoming a person. Yeah. Where like you aren't, you're no longer a human being. You are now like a public figure that I can throw rocks at. And and so I mean, one of the things that that whole experience taught me was just like, hey, so there's there's somebody on the other side of all of this reading these comments. And so like I and because I'm a guy, like I I'll joke around about stuff. I'll make like and in the past I've probably said stuff that I thought, oh, this is just me being funny or whatever and not realizing like, oh, they don't have a brand team reading these comments. Like that individual person is reading these comments and that's not funny anymore. And so like, so I don't know, I think it's just taught me to have more compassion. And when I see other people going through something difficult, like I will go out of my way to try to reach out to that person and be like, hey, not everyone on the internet hates you, just like three people do. And they're the loudest three people. And so like, just just keep doing the thing that you're doing. It's, it's gonna be okay. I'm going to check our pork loin here. I used to have a saying at Proctor U to, oh, baby, we're getting ready. I think we're almost there. Actually, I probably need to turn this thing down a little bit. I had a saying at Proctor U that got me through a lot of tough times, which was we were test proctors, right? And so sometimes you just got to admit that you're the type of business that no one is going to say you did a good job. Yeah. You know, we, we used to, I used to call it the dentist effect. Do you ever see anyone go on Twitter and say, man, let me tell you about my dentist. Okay, dude, I went to the dentist today. He was gentle. He was not, no one does that, right? Yeah. But, but let that guy make a mistake and slip with his drill and hurt you a little bit more or whatever. And you're going to go and scream about it online. I think that's, you know, I, it's one of the reasons why Yelp has always been such a, um, like I, I have a love hate relationship with Yelp because I think Yelp is great for the businesses that I think people are motivated to go say when they do a good job. Yeah. But, um, like Proctor, you our, our business had a Yelp page. Well, <laughs> What do you think was on that Yelp page? Like yeah. we, we did millions and millions of exams every year. And on that Yelp page would be the 19 people out of 6 million or whatever that had a bad experience. And they go and, the, and it was just completely divorced from we had all this data that would show how great of a job we did and how satisfied people that took the test with us where they were so satisfied. They were taking it home. Thank you for not making me drive somewhere. This is great. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But they were not motivated to go out onto the, into the world and leave Google comments and things like yeah. it, it just I learned so much from that experience, similar to what you're talking about, how you learned from your experience. I learned that it's not um, it's you, you always have to stop and think about what is motivating whatever it is you're reading or where where this came from. I saw, you know, I started to see media articles as now, why would somebody have written that? Yeah. Is that a true story or is there or, or how did why did they word that you know i've started to be aware of when i was being manipulated by a headline um or an article placement that it, it, for a subject that i had no, nothing invested in like you know yeah local restaurant you know has been blah 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 right and you go and and it was written in such a way so that i immediately jumped to inclusion i get angry i click on it and that click is ding that's what they wanted right yeah um so much of media today is uh, motivated by, well, not so much. It's all motivated by who can command your attention and s nuanced, reasoned discussions on, you know, complicated subjects. Don't people just, they're just scrolling, right? And yeah. so they're like, I'm going past that. And they're going to dive into the thing that's salacious and, and has a lot of scandal around it or anger or emotion, right? Yeah. I think about that a lot, like, because, because I, I have this whole other career like outside of outside of being like an internet person. That's just sort of like something that happened. But I go and speak at companies and corporations and conferences and so many like I, I I'm always just really encouraged and intrigued by just like what real business looks like. Because if you go on Twitter and you and you look at like what like business guys who talk about business on Twitter, they're almost exclusively talking about like a very, very narrow slice of a very narrow slice of what real business is. Like they're talking about a very specific thing of like internet businesses that are traditionally yeah. typically like software as a service stuff. And they're like this, but they see that as the whole world. And uh, I live in Springfield, Missouri. And there is like, uh, I live, actually I live outside. I live in Rogersville, Missouri. Um, but I work in Springfield. My office right now where I'm talking to you from is in Springfield field and there's this road that I go to go get out of town and it's called Chestnut Expressway and then it just turns into this farm road and as you go out there there are houses that are just 
enormous. And I, as I drive out there, I always think like, what do these people do? Because <laughs> I guarantee you it's not that they're running some SaaS thing on the internet and tweeting about it. Like it's that they run like a concrete business or they have a, a stone quarry yeah. or they do all of the electrical contracting in the area. And like their life is so disconnected from like what Twitter or TikTok or YouTube, like what those people think is important. They could not give less of a crap about any of that because they're they're like actually making stuff every day and putting pipes and wires and and rocks and like they're doing things out in the world and so i just think about that a lot like that, that sometimes this thing feels really big because like the room that you're in makes it feel important. You're like, oh, all these people are talking about this. And then like you could go out on the street and just ask anybody, hey, what did you hear about the controversy about whatever the thing is on Twitter today? And all of them would go, no, I was I was doing real work today. Like I had stuff I had to do. And once you realize that, you're like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, like, like the concrete quarry or the oil refinery or the guy who's running a chemical plant, like he's not worried about what his Yelp reviews are. He's like, hey, I got to ship a million gallons of this stuff or else this this other company shuts down their assembly line. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, man. There's just like realizing that about stuff, it just kind of lets you go, oh, none of this is real. We're all just pretending here. Yeah. And so then you just like, it when it feels real, then then that's when it triggers this like fight or flight and this like, what did I do? And I feel so bad and you know, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, like this is just this weird elaborate theater thing that's happening. Um, and, and you go, oh, okay, this person's mad, but I don't even know if they're really mad because like they might just be trolling me. Like I, I'm just going to let them do what they do. I'm going to do what I do and, and realize that like the world is much bigger than this little slice. Kyle, I could talk to you all day, buddy. This has been uh, a really fun conversation. I'm going to check our port one time. Can you see that, Big Daddy? Looks Look at delicious. That. Get you some of that, baby. That's <laughs> what we like to say on the show. We're going to check. Look at this. Come at me, health inspector. Okay, we are safe port temperature. <laughs> got to go in the middle of the, the fattest part right there. Oh, yeah, we're good. We're good. You got to make sure you're not measuring the, the cheese in there. So I want to get something to get this off the grill. Kyle, if people are interested in what you do, they're probably already following you, but where can they find you if they want to connect with Kyle Sheely's world? Yeah, so kylesheely.com is my website and that's where like, that's all of my speaking stuff is up there and demo videos. Um, and then I'm just at Kyle Sheely, uh, pretty much everything. So Twitter, Facebook, yeah. Instagram, uh, TikTok, and it's K-Y-L-E-S-C-H-E-E-L-E. -E -E -E. You got it. And guys, go check out this book. I, I don't... Uh, I don't do book reviews very often. This is your book was the first uh, social media post I ever made about someone else's book and said, guys, go read this book. It's fantastic. It's how to host a Viking funeral uh, sold wherever books are sold. Go check it out. Kyle, my friend, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much, Jared. I appreciate it. And guys, if you found anything in this episode that was valuable or you learned anything, would you please tell somebody else? Make sure that you follow. Make sure that you like us. Give us a five-star review. We'd really appreciate it. And follow us on social media. We're on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. I think we're still on Friendster, wherever. I think we, we're going to create a MySpace page. Um, find us wherever you find content, and we'll see you next time on the Slow Smoke Business Show. Mm -hmm.